there's a tendency to really go in one of two extremes on days like this. One, one tendency is, is to make it sad, and, and it is kind of sad. It's a bittersweet day for sure. But there's a tendency to get a little too sad. So we're going to focus on praising the Lord. There's also a tendency on days like this to focus too much on a person. And my goal today is not to focus on a person, but let's lift our eyes to the Lord and just praise Him for what He has done. So we're going to be looking at a passage that from start to finish is just focused on praise be to God for what He has done. Now, as I reflect over this season, I like to use the word chapter, this chapter that, that I've spent at Venture Church. Now, the, the reason I like using the, the word chapter is our lives are stories. And, and chapters, you, know, you don't rip them out of a book. Chapters build on each other. And a chapter is always part of your story. And even when you move to the next chapter, that, that chapter is still part of your story. And, and when I think back many years from now on this chapter of my life, of my journey, of my story, of our story as a family that we've spent at Venture Church, I will always be grateful to the Lord for what He has done at Venture Church. Now let me reminisce for just a little bit. Then, then I promise you, there's a lot we're going to look at in the Word. But when I think over Venture, there's so many things that I just want to praise the Lord for. When we came here... Uh, about five years ago, we knew that Venture was a church that loved each other well. And those of you that know a little bit of my story know that I kind of came limping into Venture Church. We had gone through kind of a rough transition at a previous church. And what we really wanted was to come to a place where we could love and be loved. And we knew that's what Venture Church is. And we got here, and five years later, we can say that is true. You have loved me well. You have loved my family well. Uh, we, we love this church body. We love this church. And that is expressed so vividly in our life groups. And this is where we really are able to dig into each other's lives and to share lives and to share the Word of God. It's been a highlight for me for the last, this last few months my life group is a group of young guys, and we get together every Tuesday morning at Carl's Jr. for a sausage and egg biscuit and a Diet Coke and just work our way through Scripture, and it's been awesome. I'm the oldest guy there by at least 25 or 30 years, but it is awesome to be there and to share the Word together. Before that, we had this season of ministry where we had people in our homes every Thursday night. Jill fixed a meal for everyone. And we got to dig into the Word. We got to share not only the Word of God, but share life. Speaking of life, there were three babies born uh, in that life group. It was an awesome season of ministry to which I just look back and say, praise be to God for what He has done. But once you get into venture, you learn that even though it's a, a warm church family that loves each other, it's more than that. This is a church that is serious about engaging our community with the gospel. And sometimes that means you're willing to do some crazy stuff. I mean, we have had for years a perfectly fine Christmas Eve service in this gym. And then we got this crazy idea. What if we went to a barn with horses and it stinks like horses? And as a church family, you said, let's try it and see what happens. And there are people who would have never come to a Christmas Eve service in a gym that go and experience a, a fresh Christmas experience in a barn. A few years ago, the city came to us and said, hey, we love what you do with kids in a park with a circus tent. What if you did that at the 4th of July? And we're thinking, we're exhausted by 4th of July. We just had all these kids in a park. But you know what this church did? We said, here's an opportunity for the gospel. So even though it's really hot on 4th of July, even though we're really tired, we're going to go set up a circus tent and paint faces and do crafts and this kind of stuff because we love our community. Even this past year, there, there's one Sunday a year we can't meet in this gym. So we, again, a crazy idea. How about let's go in a park and have men bake cakes for a cake baking contest. And you know what? The, we said, sure, let's do it and see what the Lord does. And just this willingness to embrace and engage our community is an awesome part of Venture Church. Well, I mean, we see this through our MOPS ministry, reaching young moms in our community. We see this through the 
many, many bags of groceries we carry to the cars of, of seniors in our community that are in need. We see this as people are praying and looking for opportunities to serve and to share with those five to ten people that God has placed in our lives that we can reach with the gospel. For that, I say praise be to God. A church that not only loves each other, but loves our community. And by the grace of God, He's opened doors across the world. I mean, we are a little church that meets in a gym. But if you go down to Siloe Wellness Center, they will say we are grateful for Venture Church. Or if you go to Door of Faith Orphanage, they will know who Venture Church is. They get birthday cards from Venture Church. Every kid in there. We've built homes with Hands of Mercy in Mexico. We're partnering with the Hovivians as they plant churches in Ireland. We've, we've entered over the past few years partnerships where we're praying and remembering and encouraging missionaries in all, all different parts of the world. Five or six different missionary groups all the way from India to Thailand to the Dominican Republic where this little church in a gym is making a global impact for the gospel to which I just say, praise be to God for what He's doing at Venture Church. I'm also grateful that I've spent time with the leadership at Venture Church. Venture Church is blessed with a great group of elders. People who love the Lord, who love the church, and don't take this for granted with elders. They also like each other. <laughs> it doesn't always happen. And that's just the elder board. I mean, you can go back into the, into the hallway here and see those who are working with our kids' ministry, teaching the Word of God. Now, you think Aaron looks... I'm sorry. <laughs> you think Eric looks good in orange. I don't know if you've seen Aaron Milligan yet or not, but he's got orange tennis shoes, orange pants, orange shirt. He's back there... I'll say teaching the kids. There's no way the kids are going to fall asleep with him wearing that much orange this morning, but it's awesome. But you look at those who are serving and teaching our kids. You look at those who are leading us in worship. You look at those who come faithfully and set up and tear down every Sunday. You look at those who are leading and serving at Venture Church, and it's just awesome to see God at work. It's, and the donut table is, is just the highlight, right? I'll, I'll give Diane a plug. She needs an assistant. So somebody step up to the plate and help her with donuts, all right? So, but it's awesome, isn't it? And by the way, when we're talking about leadership, I, I do want to pause and just publicly recognize Rob and Amy for their leadership adventure. Your steady leadership, your servant heart uh, is just reflected throughout this, this, this whole church. And so many times on days like this, it's easy to acknowledge the guy that's leaving and ignore the guy that's staying. And I just want to make sure that, actually, let's just pause and honor uh, Rob and Amy uh, for their, their ministry. When, when Jill and I were praying five years ago about you know, what in the Lord is the Lord going to have next for us, um, I came home from a, a really rough elder meeting one night and had trouble sleeping. And somewhere in the middle of the night, I got this idea, what if it would work for us to go help Rob and Amy adventure? And uh, when I told that to Jill the next morning, her face just lit up and she said, yes, that's it. And we were praying that this is what would happen. And part of it because we wanted to share ministry with our friends. And when I started sensing the Lord stirring my heart of maybe he's calling me to another work, I told Rob, We've shared ministry as friends for five years. I want to go through this transition as friends as well and be as open with you and tell you everything that's going on and just walk through this road as friends, which we have, and I'm grateful for that. So praise be to God for all that He has done at Venture Church. When you have a church that loves each other well, that engages their community, that has global impact and solid leadership, there's a lot to praise God for in a church. And that, again, I want that to be our focus. Praise be to God. And I know a few passages that give praise to God for what He has done more powerfully than Ephesians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do this morning, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So if you're looking for a theme, a main idea, something to remember, 
after this message, it's really simple today. Praise God for all He has done for us. It's that simple. That's what this passage declares. Praise God for all He has done for us. Now, I just wrote a really long paper. A really, really long paper. And you could say that this passage is a really, really long sentence. I don't think I could have gotten away with writing a sentence this long because when you start at verse 3 and go down to verse 14, it's actually one sentence in the original languages. I would have got all kinds of red ink for writing a sentence that goes on this long. But Paul can get away with it because the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. So it works, right? But where this paragraph, this long sentence, is kind of like a paper that we would write, is it begins with a thesis statement. Now, if you haven't written papers in a long time, a thesis statement, you basically say what you're going to say in an opening sentence, and then you develop it for the next few paragraphs or for that next section. So this is what happens in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. The first sentence is the thesis. This is the truth that's going to be developed all the way through the end of this really long sentence when you get down to verse 14. So let's begin by looking at the thesis statement in verse 3, and then we'll work our way through the rest. He begins with this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Wow. If you're using the New International Version, by the way, it doesn't begin by saying, Blessed be the God and Father. It, it just begins by saying, praise be to God. This is where we got the, the title for this message, is the NIV uh, translation of this phrase. Blessed be God. And it's interesting, blessed be God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of blessings going on in this verse. But it's, a, it, it's not a call to praise God. And, and this is a subtle distinction, but I think it's important. It's not when we looked at, at Psalm 34 where he, he's saying, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His... He, he's not saying, come join me in worshiping. This is just Paul worshiping. This is Paul saying, praise God. Blessed be God. It's not even so much an invitation for us to worship God. This is just Paul pouring out his worship, and we just get caught in the flow of Paul's worship to God, praising God, blessing God for all that he has done for us. And it is us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. The recipients of these blessings are those of us who are Christ followers, those of us who have placed our faith in the risen Lord Jesus we're the recipients of all these blessings. And notice what it says, who has blessed us in Christ. If there's a short phrase that is the key to this passage is those two words, in Christ. In the next few verses, we will see 11 different times some variation of this is used, whether it's in Christ, in Him, in whom. Or all, it, it, this is all based on being in Christ. And not to get too deep in the theological weeds here, but... To really understand Paul, you need to understand this. That when we come to the place of turning from our sins and placing our faith in Jesus, it's not just that we are forgiven, but our entire status has changed. Our standing has changed. We are placed in Christ. There's a union between Christ and the Christ follower. And when you get to chapter 2, it even says that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are in Christ. In another passage, Paul develops it this way, that you used to be in Adam. And, and as people who were in Adam, we are participants in the, the sin of Adam, in the death of Adam that passed to all, all people, the sin nature. All of this is because we were in Adam. But as Christ followers, we are now in Christ. And as people who are in Christ, we are now participants in the life, in the crucifixion, the resurrection, the eternal life, the divine nature, the righteousness, the holiness. We are participants in this because we are in Christ. We've often said, talking about how our sin was placed on Christ at the cross, but His righteousness has been placed on us. 
So this is what it means. When we talk about being in Christ, this becomes our identity. This is who we are at the core. We are people who, though we did not deserve it, who are guilty by nature and deserving of the wrath of God, we've been placed in Christ. And since we are in Christ, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly places. This is awesome. Now now let me say this. When you read these words like spiritual blessings and in the heavenly realm, it's, it's, it's easy to think of this as something that's kind of out there and not very practical. It's easy to think, well, this is something that might be true of us one day, or this is something that exists. Maybe this is our position, but but it doesn't really affect the reality of our day-to-day life. And to, to combat that, I would just say, think about the book of Ephesians. What Paul does in these letters is he'll take the first part of the letter and develop some rich theological truths. But then he will move into how we should then live in light of these theological truths. We, 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 the, the fancy words, are, are, it starts off with indicatives. Indicatives are things that are true of us theologically. And then it moves into imperatives or commands. But you never have the commands without the theology. You never have the, uh, the imperative without the indicative. I'm sorry if I'm confusing you with, with, with those words. I'm just getting excited this morning. But, but they, they, they work together. And so here's the thing. When you read Ephesians, you get to the last half of the book, and it gets very, here's how to have unity as a church. Here's how husbands are supposed to love your wives. Here's how wives are supposed to love your husbands. Here's how children are supposed to obey your parents. Here's how fathers are supposed to relate to your children. I mean, it gets immensely practical. And here's my point. You can have, we can have unity as a church. We can love our wives. Wives can respect our husbands. We can lead our kids. Kids can re- respond well to parents. Why? Because of the truth in the beginning. Because we have been placed in Christ and blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so if you look at this letter as a whole, you read these amazing truths at the beginning. You are in Christ blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And because of that, you can live out everything you read in the last half of the book. So do you see how this works together? This is not when you, even when you see words like, well, these are spiritual blessings. They're of the spirit. They're they're in the heavenly realm somewhere out there. So maybe one day they'll be true of me. No, these are the things now that empower us and equip us to live out the Christian life. Well, you may ask, what are these spiritual blessings? I'm so glad you asked. Because that's what the rest of the passage talks about. Remember, this is a thesis statement. Praise God because He has placed us in Christ and He has blessed us with these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And now you get to see what these blessings are and you get to see in the next few verses all that God has done for us so that we can cry out, praise be to God. Now to keep things a little easier, I'm going to give four categories in here of what these spiritual blessings are that He has given us in Christ. Some of them will include lots of of sub-blessings that we're not going to spend as much time on. But the first thing we see as we move into verse 4, one of these spiritual blessings is that He chose us. Look look, look what we read when we get to verse 4 even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Now, anytime we talk about God choosing us, anytime we get into election, there's always a little bit of tension because we wrestle with we, of the mystery of how much of this is God choosing us and how much of this is us choosing God. But, but when you look at the Scripture, you see that both are taught. And Paul is not here arguing for a position. This is not stale theology. This this is not an, an argument in a dorm room. What this is, is praise to God when you realize that even though there's an element where I chose to put my faith in Jesus, ultimately, I, I praise God that He chose me. And, and look what it goes on to say. It emphasizes that He chose us before the foundation of the world. Let that sink in for a second. How does the Bible begin? In the beginning, God did what? 
created the heavens and the earth, right? One of the first things he says, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And it was what? It was good. Then you get to this passage. Before the foundations of the earth. Before God spoke all of this into existence, He said, I want you. And you. Even you. And you. I mean, do you see why Paul is just saying, praise God for what He has done. He chose us even before He created the world. We were chosen as the ones who would be in Christ. So that we would be what? Holy and blameless. Why are we holy and blameless? <laughs> because we're in Christ. This begins to talk about our, our status, our nature, our, who we are at the, core, at the core of our being. It's not so that we would go out and suddenly we, we live these perfect lives and never mess up and never do anything wrong. It's saying, no, you are declared holy and blameless because you are in Christ. We don't deserve that. So we just cry out and say, praise be to God that He chose us before the foundations of the earth. Well, choosing is a bit of an abstract thought. So as we move on to the second blessing that we find, we, we, we find something that makes a little more sense to us, and that's not only He chose us, but He adopted us. Let's keep reading. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Adoption. Now, when I think of choosing, especially in a gym, here's what I think of. Pick up basketball games, right? Say you've got 12 guys and you're going to play five-on-five -five basketball. Two guys are going to be sitting and watching and calling next, right? Then you've got two guys that are captains. And, and these, the, the, everyone else lines up. I want you. I want you. I want you. And then you pick your teams and you play basketball. And then at the end of the game, all the teams change again. And you get new captains and new teams and, and on and on. Choosing can look like that. But if you start thinking not choosing teams but choosing through adoption. That's a whole different image. Suddenly, you're part of a family. You have an inheritance. You are fully accepted and embraced and loved, and you have all these rights and privileges and responsibilities as part of a family. And that when God chooses us, it's not just a matter of I'm going to choose to forgive you, but I'm going to choose to to bring you into my family. And here's what this passage emphasizes. That God delights. This is according to His will. In the NIV, it even, it even emphasizes His pleasure and His will. Now, I, I, now just look at it. I know there are some adoption stories in this crowd, and I love stories of adoption. But my thinking has changed a little bit because when I think of adoption stories, I always think about how awesome for this child to move into a home. But my thinking has changed a little bit because as much as I like seeing the joy in the child's face, I love celebrating with parents. These parents who have been praying for this, who have been piles and piles of paperwork and expense and waiting and court dates and hearings and all this stuff, and then finally the adoption is finalized and the parents are just elated. And it just struck me that it is God's pleasure to adopt us into His family. That that's the love that He has for us. Look what Look what He has done. And it's all to the praise of what? His grace. You don't earn your way into adoption. You are the recipients out of the grace of others to be adopted into a family 
And so God not only chose us, but he adopted us to the praise of his grace by which he has blessed us. Well, as we keep moving, we will see that he has chosen us. He's adopted us. And then as we keep reading, he has also redeemed us. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, the idea of redemption, and we've mentioned this many times, is is the idea of purchasing, to to redeem something. And so we have this beautiful picture of we have been chosen and we have adopted, but it took place through the means of redemption, through a purchase that, that God sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross as our substitute. And in doing so, He purchased or redeemed us. And in, in, in so we have the forgiveness of our sins. Now, what's interesting about this passage is that you have present tense. We have redemption. We have forgiveness. And then you have past tense because it's His grace that was lavished upon us. One of my favorite phrases in all of Scripture. When was His grace lavished upon us? Well, at at the cross. And there's a past tense to this. This This is all based on what Jesus accomplished on the cross. His grace was lavished upon us through the cross of Christ. And and at that moment when we chose to place our faith in Jesus and and became participants in what Christ accomplished on the cross, His grace was lavish. God's not skimpy with His grace. That's a strong word. He lavished His grace upon us. And because this happened in the past, then right now we have redemption in Him. We have forgiveness because what Christ said. That's the life that we now live. But notice in this with redemption, there's also a future tense. As we saw towards the end of this passage, that in all wisdom and insight, he, He's making known to us the mystery of His will, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, the end of times, to unite all things in Christ things in heaven and things on earth. So redemption looks like this, that there's a past tense of what Christ accomplished on the cross and as it was applied to us. And then we see this present tense that we have redemption, we have forgiveness, and this future tense that one day our redemption will be complete when all things are united, everything on heaven and on earth are united in Christ. As Paul writes in Philippians, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have you ever just stopped and thought, I hadn't really thought about this till, till this week. What a blessing it is that God has given us knowledge of what happens at the end of the story. I mean, how many times have we gone through hardships or have we wept around gravesides only to think, but we have a promise from God. This is not the end. It's going to get better. One day all things will be united in Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess. We will live with Him. We will reign with Him. We will be together forever with Him. What a blessing it is that God in His wisdom chose to give. Now, it's still a mystery. We don't know everything. But He's given us insight into the mystery so that we know that this is not the end of the story. What a blessing that God chose to reveal to us the mystery of what's to come. That our redemption does not end here. There's a future tense to redemption. And this becomes our hope, our confidence, our assurance. Because God chose to reveal that to us. Praise be to God. Because we are in Christ and He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He has chosen us. He has adopted us. He has redeemed us. Now, as we keep reading in the passage, he goes back to the idea of choosing a bit in verse 11. But he starts talking about the inheritance. He's on this theme of the fullness of time. And as we see this, in Him we have obtained an inheritance, 
having been predestined according to the purpose of Him, who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. So he's, again, coming back to celebrating that He chose us. But as we keep moving, we're going to see that the fourth blessing, I think, uh, that comes out of this passage, that we have been sealed. We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Let's keep reading. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. I love this. saying there's a time when you heard the gospel of your salvation and you believed. There's a time when you were confronted with this message that because of our sin, we stand guilty before God. But God, out of His rich out of His deep love and His rich mercy for us, gave His Son while we were still sinners so that we could be made alive together with Christ. You heard this message and you responded and believed. And when that happened, you were forgiven, you were adopted, you realized you'd been chosen by God, you were redeemed, but you were also given the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a seal, seals you so that you will stand before God one day in glory. He will keep you in Christ. And it's a guarantee. There's an inheritance. We're family and there's an inheritance. We share this inheritance with Jesus. And we can rest assured that we will share in this inheritance because we have been given, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that we will participate in that inheritance. He chose us. He adopted us. He redeemed us. He sealed us with His Spirit. And notice how it ends, to the praise of His glory. This passage begins, praise be to God, and it ends to the praise of His glory. This is a passage that just, we look at all that God has done for us. How He has blessed us in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, through choosing us, adopting us, redeeming us, and sealing us in a way that it just causes us to just lift our hands and cry out, praise be to God for all He has done for us. Yeah. So I wanted to wrap up by just saying why my motivation for sharing this passage this morning. Why did we spend the last few minutes in Ephesians 1? I had three reasons. I'll see if I can remember them all. First is that I just want us to praise God this morning. And I started off by saying this. This is a day to praise God. To praise God for who we are as a church. To praise God for all that He has done. And when it's a tendency to be overly sad or to focus too much attention on a person, I would rather turn this sorrow into worship, this sadness into worship. And any focus that you would place on a person, lift your eyes and praise God instead. Because He's the one who is worthy. He's the one who has placed us in Christ and blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Secondly, I just, I wanted to remind you that God is good. Sometimes in transitions that can be hard, it's easy for us to question, God, why are you doing this? I don't understand. And passages like this just remind us, God is good. Look what He's done. Even at the moments that that can be sad for us, we can look and say, praise God, who has placed us in Christ and blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He has chosen us, adopted us, redeemed us, and sealed us by the Spirit. And even though I may not understand, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because he's good. And he knows what he's doing. Two weeks ago, Rob preached, I thought, an excellent sermon on Psalm 27. And it's like, what do we do in times of fear? And if you were here, you may remember his last point was, look for the goodness of God. 
I thought that was a great word. That in times of fear, look for signs of God's goodness. So I wanted us to go to Ephesians 1 this morning because that's where we see God's goodness. Praise God for all He has done for us. My third motivation, and this is to remind you of something you've heard me say many times. This passage reminds me to always assume that God is at work in the lives of people. Here's what I mean. We can stand here as Christ followers and say, praise be to God. Look what He has done in my life. He chose me. He he adopted me. He redeemed me. He sealed me with the Spirit. He has placed me in Christ and blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. You know what? It's not just about us. This is the work that God is still doing. There are people in your lives. Those five to ten people in your life that you've been praying for. Do you know what God still wants to do? He still wants to... Choose and adopt and redeem and seal with the Spirit. And here's what God does. He takes people that He has placed in Christ and blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and He brings them together to form a church. And He places a church in the community so that this church can take this good news that we have experienced and been entrusted with into the community. This is why we you know, sit in a barn on Christmas Eve and set up tents on 4th of July and do all these crazy things, even have men baking cake and even braver people eating those cakes that the men bake. We, we do all of these things. Why? Because there's a message that we desperately need to get into our community and around the world. This is what God has called us to do. And we need, when we read passages like this, that say, look what God has done. We need to assume that God is still at work in the lives of people and we engage the mission that He has called us to. Now, speaking for my family, we covet your prayers. We're not walking into an easy situation. And the only reason we're going is that we are convinced that God has called us to go and step into this role. It's not easier. It's going to be a challenge. But we go confident that God is at work in the lives of people. And I understand that when we move from one chapter of our lives into the next chapter, it's it's difficult to say goodbye. And in some ways, you know, there'll be some challenges for venture moving forward. But don't forget this. That God is at work in the lives of people and He has raised up Venture Church as a church in this community that He wants to use to bless the people and even bless the nations. And He's provided leadership and He's provided a warm, loving community that longs to reach the community and the rest of the world. This is a good place to be. Let's move forward. As we move off to Newberry Park and as you continue to engage the community here in the Pass area, let's do so. Remembering that God is good and assuming that He is at work in the lives of people. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank You for these rich truths that we have experienced this morning. Thank You that in Your grace that You lavished upon us and to the praise of Your grace and of Your glory, You have taken us who are so undeserving And you have placed us in Christ and blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You have chosen us. You have adopted us. You have redeemed us. You have sealed us with your spirit as a guarantee that we will share in the inheritance and glory. But for right now, I pray that we'll be encouraged by this word. That it will cause us to praise you. It will cause us to remember that you're good. And it will cause us to assume that this wonderful work that you have worked in our lives, you are still actively pursuing people to accomplish in their lives as well. And that we would live with the assumption that you are at work in the lives of people. Father, from a personal standpoint, I am just overwhelmed with gratitude for this church and for what you have done in my life and in our family's life as a result of being in this church. I pray that you bless them as they move forward. I pray that you bless Rob, the elders, 
life group leaders, those who teach, those who serve, those who gather to worship, that you would continue to bless this church and use this church as a light in the community, a church who loves each other well, and a church who longs to make a difference in this community and around the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we give you all the glory for this church that you love way more than we do. This church that you purchased with your own blood, we give you all the glory. And we just say praise be to God. In Jesus' name, amen.